If you'd asked me at around the midway point of this season, I might have said, Ahsoka is not the worst Star Wars production to release under the Disney Empire. Not yet, anyway. It'll take some doing to beat out The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, and I doubt any TV show could come close to replicating the Death Star-like damage done to the franchise by its failures in the cinema. Nor is Ahsoka the worst Disney Plus Star Wars show, not yet, again. For damage to lore, canon, continuity, and general nostalgia, that honor probably rests with Obi-Wan Kenobi. For sheer pointless banality, well, that's the book of Boba Fett. For the sheer amount of utter nonsense packed into every single episode, the Mandalorian Season 3 takes the crown. The combined script for my two-part review of that calamity comes in at more than 73,000 words. You could write a book about how terrible The Mandalorian is, and apparently that's what I've done. Ahsoka still has the time to match its regrettable forebears, of course, but the early evidence suggests that it will fall some way short, which is to say it will wind up being quite bad, but nowhere near as remarkably awful as the Disney Plus standard. Such as the world we now live in, Ahsoka looks set to be an above average Star Wars show, but only because the average rests alongside the wreck of the Titanic. While I've got you here, a word from my sponsor. I recently played Dungeon Hunter with some kids next door after they kicked their ball into my garden. They went down into the dungeon in my basement to get it back and some orcs killed them and dumped their bodies in a bath full of acid. I thought, oh god damn those orcs again, I thought I'd got rid of them after they killed old Mrs. Wilson from across the road when she came to complain about the noise again. But those damned orcs just, they just keep coming back. If you've got an infestation of orcs in your basement dungeon, you'll need Frank's famous fumigation company. Oh, wait, what? Oh no, it's the, that's the wrong. That's the wrong. Dungeon Hunter is back. This venerable ARPG franchise from Gameloft and Goat Games returns for the first time since 2015 with Dungeon Hunter 6 for Android and iOS. The game is totally free to download. You can use the link in my description or scan the QR code and give it a go. Choose from one of five distinct customizable classes, warrior, assassin, mage, archer, and boon sister, and hone them with experience and powerful gear. Raiding dungeons can be dangerous business. Just ask my neighbor's kids. But there's safety in numbers. Gather and recruit your favorite lieutenants and form a team. From the fire-breathing Harbinger Wyvern to the seductive Dreamy Delphine, the friends and allies you summon complement whatever playstyle you prefer. You can also form guilds with friends and go hacking and slashing your way through Valencia's forbidden towers in search of fame and fortune. You'll meet a wide variety of mobs and some truly fearsome bosses on your way, so make sure you go in prepared for a fight. Every aspect of the game has seen significant upgrades since the last installment. Graphics, soundtrack, professional voice acting all make for a wonderfully immersive experience that is bound to keep you playing for hours. Get a special starter pack worth some $50 using my link in the description. That includes 10 summoning scrolls, one SSR lieutenant, the demonic wolf, and one accessory pack. Dungeon Hunter 6 releases this very month, so you can be amongst the first to take the quest. You can use your game account to enter the launch lucky spin event for free to win great prizes like an iPhone 15 Pro Max, a PS5, an Apple Watch, and even more. This is all beginning on October the 15th. Check out the description for further details. Use the link in my description and register today. That's Dungeon Hunter 6 from Gameloft and Goat Games. Good luck on your journey. Try not to die like old Mrs. Wilson did. Ahsoka is, though, the worst of the Disney Star Wars propositions. Taking only the premise of each current entry, The Mandalorian was a story about a bounty hunter who must save a Force-sensitive child from the rapacious Imperial Remnant, a galaxy-hopping adventure show. The Book of Boba Fett picks up the story of its iconic eponymous lead and depicts him rising to the throne vacated by Jabba the Hutt in a story of crime and its lords. Obi-Wan Kenobi plugs the gap between two much-loved depictions of a franchise mainstay, his journey between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. Now, we know how all of those things eventually played out, and each was terrible in new and interesting ways, not the least of which was the sacrifice of genuine and immense potential. Kenobi in particular was so tragic because it could have been so much. The mechanic is that which ensures the sequel trilogy won't be dethroned by streaming nonsense in terms of the damage done. Disappointment scales according to the potential being wasted. Ahsoka arguably benefits from this, then, because of its piss-poor sales pitch. It's a show about cartoon characters bought into live action, finishing 
telling a story most of the audience never even began, paying off a plot and a set of relationships set up in the relative silence of Rebels and the Clone Wars. I don't mean to upset fans of either show when I say that in the grand scheme of things they don't really matter. By all accounts, Rebels in particular was well received, popular amongst its fanbase. But that comes with a heavy qualification. Its fanbase really isn't very big in the grand scheme of things. These things are all relative. Is its fanbase large compared to other cartoons in other less renowned franchises? Well, probably yes. Does it represent even a plurality of the Star Wars fanbase though? Mm, almost certainly not. I think I pissed off a couple of ardent fans of Rebels while streaming on Mr. Brown Alliance the other week. I suggested that basing an expensive marquee production off an old animated show, the viewership of which doesn't much exceed a good video of mine when you break it down episode by episode, might not be the best idea in the world. That was slightly hyperbolic, but it's nowhere near as hyperbolic as it should be. Plenty of healthy sounding numbers for total series viewership can be found for Rebels. 22 million people watched at least 6 minutes of season 2, guys. Oh, what, what's that? There are 20 whole episodes in season 2? Um... Uh, whatever. There were two seasons following it? Oh, well, okay, but the season 4 finale did really well. Well, yeah, and apparently it got about 6 million views for part 1. That's not bad. The most relevant number sadly does not exist. That number is how many people watched all or even the greater part of Rebels in its entirety, how many people can recount its story from season 1 right the way through to the close of season 4, how many people are in any meaningful way familiar with the history of Rebels. Watching at least six minutes of the second season out of four seasons tells us very little that's useful. Back to my apparently controversial comparison, it's necessarily a rough metric, but 22 million people watching at least six minutes of a 20 episode season gives us an average of about 1.1 million people watching at least six minutes of every individual episode. Obviously that is an incredibly rough metric, necessarily so. The deeper figures are not available, so we don't know important things like average view duration, or how the views actually split between the episodes, or whether its trajectory was up or down. This would suggest that season 2 was the outlier, but as with all these things, you could kill it with a thousand qualifications. A healthy sounding 6.5 million people for the first half of the season 4 finale, however many years ago that was, rather bolsters the point I was making. Rebels, whatever its storytelling quality, and I'm not denying it has any, is, even at its height, a tiny installment in the Star Wars universe. A live action Ahsoka that stands as a love letter to Rebels and the Clone Wars, necessarily entails a hyper-particular venture that will be lost, in whole or in part, on the vast majority of potential viewers. For a franchise struggling to retain an old audience, never mind to attract a new one, this is a thoroughly bizarre strategic move. And it's worth stressing a sense of scale here. The US population in the year 2017 was around 325 million people. Per statista research from that same year, half of the entire population of the United States had seen Empire Strikes Back, so that's 162 million people in just one country. The lowest scoring film at that time was Rogue One, and even then, more than a third of the entire US population had seen it. Cross any random person in the street and ask them to tell you what happens in Star Wars, and you'll get a pretty good answer from most of them. The Force Awakens benefited immensely from being, functionally, the same film as A New Hope, because it was the same film as A New Hope. It traded on mass familiarity. Any given cinema goer, even a casual fan, even a not much of a fan, would have at least a vague idea what they were watching. Who these old characters are, whose helmet that is, what that soundtrack is evoking. No equivalent study exists for Star Wars Rebels, and so I have only to appeal to our innate sense of the plausible. Show any given person on the street a picture of Ahsoka Tano, or Ezra Bridger, or Sabine Wren, and how many do you think could even name them? Absent lightsabers, how many do you think would even know what franchise they're a part of? How many of those people on the street would have seen a single minute of a single episode of any Star Wars animated show? And that's of course compounds the problem. Not only does Ahsoka call to a small audience, but it calls to a long story, the entirety of which will be familiar to an even smaller audience. There are 133 episodes of The Clone Wars over seven seasons, and 75 episodes of Rebels across four seasons. It wouldn't matter if the stories contained therein were the best that were ever told, the fact is it's a niche thing. It's a niche show. And the more you rely on familiarity with the niche to decode your latest major offering, well, the less approachable that offering is. 
by definition. This all makes Ahsoka a curious strategic choice, but not one that is entirely unsalvageable. You can hint at old stories, you can service fans of older works in the context of a brand new show telling a brand new story, one that serves as an introduction, not an exclusive continuation. When Tolkien begins The Lord of the Rings, we enter Middle-earth thousands of years into its history, yet the story is still intelligible, the characters are believable, the relationships between them are understandable, because, though it is continuing a long history, it begins with new story. Films, TV shows, video games and books that rest on extensive world building have the difficult but rewarding job of balancing lore with story in a way that optimizes but does not exhaust the viewer's attention, their capacity for new information. And this is a task at which Ahsoka has quite impressively failed. A show about Ahsoka Tano that sees her begin a new adventure could still draw on past stories for colour and depth, and stand as an invitation to viewers to peruse history at their leisure, but that is categorically distinct from a story that relies on that history even to make the most rudimentary sense to its audience. The choice at the outset is between an Ahsoka Tano show and a live-action Rebels Season 5. Ahsoka gave us Rebels Season 5, so if you've not seen much or any of the preceding four seasons, ah, eh, good luck to you. It's actually quite impressive how little the show does to make sense to its general audience. You could come away having seen all eight episodes, and unless you'd seen the old cartoons, I doubt you could tell me anything meaningful at all about the character of Ezra Bridger, which is especially fun since he serves as a MacGuffin for more than half of the entire season. All the preceding constitutes meta-analysis, I suppose. Who is the show for? What its target audience is? How will it fare with new viewers and such? The conclusion to this preamble is that Ahsoka is the wrong show for the wrong people at the wrong time and done in the wrong way, but solely by virtue of its niche nature, that is not especially disappointing. It's not especially disappointing because there was never a great deal of potential in it to begin with. But it then poses the obvious question. Fine, you might say, the show isn't for me, but how does it hold up on its own terms? Aside from all the references I don't get, the relationships I don't know, the story I've not followed, the names I'm unfamiliar with, the history I've never seen, the villains I've never heard of, aside from all of that, is a so get any good on its own terms? Is it well written? Is the acting decent? What does it look like? Is it at all enticing? Could Ahsoka maybe make me want to go back and fill in those vast chasms in my knowledge? Does it make me want to watch Rebels or The Clone Wars? And sadly, the answer to almost all of these is no. It doesn't pack in as much stupid per second as The Mandalorian. It's not as aggressively pointless as Boba Fett. It hasn't yet assassinated any character I like, like Obi-Wan. But for all that, Ahsoka is objectively not very Good. So grab yourself a bottle of Jawa juice and let's begin with episode one. Having come straight off my Mandalorian script, I was frankly horrified to find myself in familiar territory with the opening scene of episode one. Ahsoka begins with a text crawl that looks for all the world like an afterthought, the Cliff Notes guide to Star Wars Rebels cut and pasted into Windows Movie Maker. It's worth comparing the opening crawl to any given Star Wars film just to note the amount of stuff the Ahsoka crawl throws in. The ideal Star Wars opening crawl contains only those details essential to place us in the world, and those details are relatively few. Here, for instance, is the first of all the opening crawls, and so the one you might expect to have the biggest load to shoulder. From A New Hope, it is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil Galactic Empire. During the battle, Rebel spies manage to steal secret plans to the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, an armored space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet. Pursued by the Empire's sinister agents, Princess Leia races home aboard her starship, custodian of the stolen plans that can save her people and restore freedom to the galaxy. Civil War is a universally familiar concept, spaceships likewise. We know from three short paragraphs that there is an evil empire and there is a good rebellion. This is the essential world setting. The second paragraph, which is really just two lines of text, gives us immediate and more particular context. The empire has a big weapon. Here's what it does. But some rebels stole the plans for it. And then the concluding two lines brings us immediately into the present. The plans are in the hands of somebody called Leia and the empire is chasing her. That introduces us to the entire story Star Wars Galaxy for the very first time. 
How many truly unfamiliar nouns do you see, though? I-Class Galactic Empire is a semi-familiar noun, by the way, since, for the first-time viewer, it references a universally understood concept, empire, and merely qualifies it to mean essentially space. It's an empire in space, a big galactic empire. That is semi-familiar. Unfamiliar nouns, by contrast, are important because they don't really provide any frame of reference and they don't contain their own one. You don't want to overload a new audience with unfamiliar nouns because the more of them you use, the less you'll be understood. So in A New Hope's opening crawl, we have the Death Star, and even that is immediately qualified with an explainer as to its nature and purpose, and we have Princess Leia, and that's it. Two things we're not familiar with, one of which is explained in precisely 11 words so we understand immediately, the first time a character mentions the Death Star, what they're talking about. And then given Princess Leia herself is introduced to us in the film's opening scene, well, we're effectively given all the information we need to make sense of the premise before we even leave the Tantai IV. And then, because Luke Skywalker serves as a novice hero beginning his journey, we discover everything else through the eyes of a protagonist as he leaves the familiar surroundings of the Lars homestead. It's universally popular because it's universally approachable. We learn everything else through the eyes of Luke as he learns about it. Now let's compare that with the Ahsoka opening crawl. The evil galactic empire has fallen and a new republic has risen to take its place. However, sinister agents are already at work to undermine the fragile peace. So far, not terrible. Even uses the same sinister agents formulation as the cruel from A New Hope. It's already more complex than its progenitor, a fallen empire and a new republic. It's historical information as much as it is present day information. A switch in power from one to the other that is being undermined by someone else that is all innately more complicated than a faction in power, one not in power, a battle between them. But even casual Star Wars fans know vaguely what we're going on about here. Then though, then things start to go a bit wrong. A plot is underway to find the lost Imperial Grand Admiral Thrawn and bring him out of exile. Once presumed dead, rumors are spreading of Thrawn's return, which would galvanize the Imperial remnants and start another war. This paragraph might be terse, but it is also dense. It's almost half the length of the entire Cruel from A New Hope. It contains the same number of unfamiliar nouns as the entire New Hope Cruel, two in both Grand Admiral Thrawn and Imperial remnants in one paragraph here. But more importantly, it references a ton of very particular history with a lot of present-day moving pieces. A plot is underway? By whom? Was Thrawn lost or was he exiled? How and by whom? Why presumed dead? And why now not presumed dead? How are the rumors spreading? By whom are they spread and to what end? What is Thrawn in relation to the Imperial remnants? Why would he in particular galvanize them in a way that nobody else could? When did all of the above take place? While A New Hope gives us context, Ahsoka relies on context at least as much as it gives it. Then we get former Jedi Knight Ahsoka Tano captured one of Thrawn's allies and learned of a secret map which is vital to the enemy's plan. Ahsoka searches for the map as her prisoner, Morgan Elspeth, is transported to the New Republic for trial. Again, A New Hope tells us there's an empire, a rebellion, a big weapon, some stolen plans, and that's it. The last paragraph of the Ahsoka Cruel contains more moving pieces than the entirety of the Cruel that stands as our first introduction to the entire universe. Former Jedi? Ahsoka Tano? Who? Why? Secret map? What? How? Captured Morgan Elspeth, who is she? When was she captured? Is she related to the map? Did she make the map? Is it going to end up being quite strange for her prisoner to be in a completely different part of the galaxy away from Ahsoka Tano in the first scene of the show? Yeah, you bet it will. I'm being finickety about this because it brilliantly illustrates the point I was making earlier, and it establishes a theme that will continue throughout the first two episodes of the show. Ahsoka's reliance on history hasn't been parlayed into a new story, it's weighing the story down already, and we're just finishing the opening crawl. Because Dave Filoni has seen no other option but to dump as much exposition on the audience as early and overtly as possible, just to begin catching us up with a character that he knows and loves. The point of comparing it to the New Hope opening crawl is threefold. It shows the starkly different approaches to lore, it shows the starkly different reliance on lore when it comes to making sense of the present, and it's also a preemptive shot against those people who inevitably pop up in comment sections saying things like, well you could tear the OT apart just as easily as the new stuff if you wanted to, you hater. No, evidently you cannot. A New Hope had more to introduce, and it did so in less time, and generally better. It was able to do it better because the story did not rest over much on arcane knowledge to begin with. We then kick off the episode proper, a New Republic spaceship looking to rendezvous with Home One, Admiral Akbar's flagship. The first thing you notice is that it looks generally alright, better, in fact, 
than most Disney Plus Star Wars. It's lighter, it's brighter, it feels more solid, there's a lot of attention to detail in the ship's exterior and its interior, and a degree of fidelity to Star Wars' iconic retro-futurist aesthetic. If there's one thing that gets fairly consistent praise throughout the first two episodes of Ahsoka, it is the aesthetic. It is for the most part a good-looking show, even if it sometimes takes fidelity a little bit too far. For some reason, Disney Plus Star Wars shows have taken the most dated designs for Rebel Alliance uniforms and made them the New Republic standard issue. You see this matte blue and plastic belt ensemble pop up semi-frequently throughout Disney Plus shows. Coruscant Security wears these sorts of uniforms and they look horrible. I was going to say that the Rebel uniform design is easily one of the most dated aspects of the original trilogy, but actually, if you go back through those three films, you really don't see it that often. In fact, after A New Hope, you barely see it at all. If you're going to use the old style uniforms, why not pick one of the many that looks less like cheap cosplay? There are plenty of rebel uniforms to choose from. The New Republic ship picks up another ship on its scanners, but it is not Home One. It is rather a shuttle. A shuttle that pretty much anyone who has ever seen Star Wars knows is evil. Apparently though, these guys don't immediately know that it is a bad guy's ship. They just suspect that it might be. The ship, um, Captain? It's, it's kind of hard to tell the ranks here, because their medals are essentially just smarties glued to cardboard squares. We'll assume he's the ship's captain. He asks the shuttle to transmit its clearance code, in the first of several overt callbacks to OG Star Wars. Remember Han, Luke and Leia sneaking down to the forest moon? Ask them to identify themselves and transmit their clearance code. Shuttle Tidarium, transmit the clearance code for shield passage. I remember. I'm not sure whether it's meant to be more than a callback. Disney Plus Star Wars is quite taken with the idea, at least it's often expressed in The Mandalorian, that the New Republic is mirroring the worst features of its two predecessor regimes, the feckless bureaucracy of the Old Republic and the austere regulatory tyranny of the Galactic Empire. It's a theme Ahsoka will later explore in some depth in Episode 2. An empire doesn't just become a republic overnight. You will still find ex-imperials at every level of the New Republic government. Just relax, we're not in trouble yet. When are you thinking we are in trouble? Albeit in a way that kind of contradicts the idea as presented in The Mandalorian, but uh, we'll come to that when we get on to episode 2. Is this captain's mirroring of the clearance code request supposed to be a thematic, as well as a member berry callback to the Galactic Empire though? Well, maybe, maybe not. But before we have time to be particularly interested in what the show might or might not be going for, their galactic stupidity intrudes. The shuttle sends back a code that is identified as, and I quote, The signal is an old Jedi clearance code. The passengers claim to be Jedi here to see the prisoner. No, no, you stop that right now, show. What is this garbage? I'm, I'm gonna have to quote Moff Tarkin at you, just for a second. The Jedi are extinct. Their fire has gone out of the universe. You, my friend, are all that's left of their religion. It's a little bit staggering that across three seasons of The Mandalorian and an extra miserable installment known as The Book of Boba Fett, we've never actually addressed the place and state of Jedi in this period. We know Luke is around and he's building a temple, but that is basically it. Ahsoka isn't a Jedi, and Grogu isn't a Jedi, and Luke's only friends are big robot ants for some reason. That's all we know. We do know from the sequels that he builds a new Jedi Order, but where is it now? How many Jedi are there? They do tend to spawn around Dave Filoni, because Filoni seems to think that Order 66 was a mere local event. But as of yet, we know nothing about Luke's new Order. We know nothing about its relationship with the New Republic. We know nothing of any other actual Jedi toddling about the galaxy in this period. What we do know, per Tarkin, and indeed per every old Star Wars film, is that the Jedi are all but wiped out. Receiving an old Jedi clearance code is therefore absurd. I'm not sure Rebel Alliance ships would even be able to pick those up, for the same and simple reason that Jedi clearance codes would have been wiped out with the Jedi. Jedi who survived Order 66 and went around transmitting old Jedi clearance codes would not have survived it very long. The New Republic staffers on the ship are mildly surprised to receive an old Jedi clearance code, but they're not entirely dumbstruck and disbelieving, which I think by rights they should be. It merely causes them a moment's uncertainty before the captain decides, and I quote, I'm calling their bluff. Um, their, their bluff? What? kind of bluff is that? 
They transmitted a code that shouldn't exist to a ship that shouldn't really be able to identify it, staffed by people who should immediately know not to believe in it. It's not a maybe true, maybe false situation, is it really? It's rather an obviously false situation. All of galactic history tells us that this is obviously false. But you know what? This is not the galactic stupidity I was referring to. This is merely a prelude to that galactic stupidity. It's an oddity. The galactic stupidity follows. Because if you're the captain and you've received an obviously false code from an obviously evil shuttle, and you yourself have decided that the people aboard are obviously evil, which the captain has, what would you do? Would you maybe scramble fighters? Would you keep the shuttle at a safe distance and prepare to board it? Would you maybe radio someone to tell them what's going on? If you were curious about the provenance of the Jedi Code and you wanted to make sure, might you send a message to Luke to ask him if he knows about any Jedi in this part of the galaxy? Or would you simply shoot the shuttle down? Because let's remember, this obviously evil shuttle has come here of its own volition, and it has requested permission to board. The obviously evil people aboard the obviously evil shuttle, who you believe are obviously evil, want to be here. That, in and of itself, is a reason to be hyper-fucking-cautious and vigilant, you might think. But that thought process requires that you have a thought process, and this ship captain doesn't, because everyone in the Disney Star Wars galaxy has roughly the same IQ as polystyrene. So what does the ship captain do? What does calling their bluff entail? Why, it entails bringing the shuttle in and meeting it in person with five barely armed grunts and a fish. He leaves a woman in charge, by the way, so stereotypically, the entire starship is wrecked within the first five minutes. The meeting in the shuttle bay is another reference, by the way. Filoni is doing the Phantom Menace here. Ship Captain introduces himself, saying, if you don't mind my saying, it's quite a surprise meeting Jedi out here. Um, no, you spanner. It's quite a surprise meeting Jedi anywhere. They're all dead. Order 66 was a thing. It happened. I don't care what Filoni has planned. There are not hundreds of Jedi pottering about the galaxy. This entire setup is nonsensical. And more importantly, it should be seen as nonsensical in-universe as well. The two uh, Jedi we're introduced to go on to be almost interesting characters. You have the big guy, the leader, played by the dearly departed Ray Stevenson, who reliably steals every scene he's in, even as he's given scraps to work with. Alongside him, you have, um, uh, Billie Eilish. The captain calls their bluff, calling them just some overconfident Imperial trash who just pushed their luck too far. Nobody this stupid deserves to live. Happily, the captain does not. But why is it that Star Wars has to be about stupid people for stupid people these days? No one this dumb should have risen to the rank of captain, certainly not the captain of what we'll later learn is a brand new, expensive, top-of-the-line New Republic starship. No ship captain should voluntarily go along with the evil plans of obviously evil people who obviously want to be here, and no ship captain who did that has any right to express surprise when these obviously evil people turn out indeed to be obviously evil. You can tell, by the way, that I drafted this part of the script way back when episode 1 first aired because incredibly dumb people rising to incredibly high positions really doesn't seem so shocking after all. And at least they don't try and tell us that Captain Fuck Up here is actually an intergalactic mega genius. But uh, yeah, let's not preempt. We can take in the glory of Thrawn later. After a short show me your identification reference, the fighting starts. Despite suspecting that these obviously evil people are obviously evil, none of the laughable security gimps thought it might be wise to have so much as one hand on their blasters, and most of them get cut down by Billy Eilish while they're still fumbling with their holsters. Big Ray stabs the ship captain with his lightsaber, so. Well, he'll be fine, right? Nobody dies from getting stabbed by lightsabers anymore? Ah, uh, foreshadowing. Though a big old battle has broken out in their hangar bay, the woman up on the bridge has not thought it worth activating any kind of security protocol. Somebody hands her a pistol, but that's as much preparation as we get. They've not closed any blast doors, they've not scrambled any troops, they don't even shut down the fucking elevator to the bridge. What were they doing, just hoping Billy Eilish read a sign on the wall saying, do not use lift in case of emergency? So, to nobody's surprise, and frankly to my delight, since stupid people dying improves the gene pool and more of them should try it, Billy Eilish comes up the lift and massacres everyone on the bridge. Or almost everyone. I can't help but notice there was a body positivity activist in the shot last time we were here. I couldn't help but notice because she is rather large, but now she's gone. Waddled off to the canteen, probably. Big Ray, meanwhile, is fighting his way down to the detention level, a task made much easier by the fact that the New Republic troopers seem to be aiming at his lightsaber 
rather than around it, and he promptly arrives at the cell door. Here he uses a very handy force unlock skill that's never been seen before in Star Wars, with the possible but qualified exception of Palpatine snapping Luke's handcuffs. The qualification is that he's Sheev and he does what he wants. I mention force unlock though, because it is, as we see here, very effective against locked objects. I wonder if maybe there'll be a moment later where an equivalent skill should have been but won't be used. The prisoner is this woman, and it's only thanks to the live review we did over at Mr. Brown Alliance that I can tell you who she is, because I had completely forgotten. Do you remember Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 5? No? Well, lucky you, if you do remember Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 5, you will recognize this woman as the villain of that particular charade. The one who has the samurai jewel with Ahsoka from whence Mando gets his Beskar spear. I have a few things to say in part two of my Mando review about the, um, curious way the Disney Plus shows tie together. One of their curious aspects is that they do occasionally decide that a fun little cameo villain from a forgettable episode of a forgettable season several years ago should, just occasionally, be bought out of retirement and made into a very important person, replete with new personality and backstory. For example, do you remember how, in Season 2, Episode 5 of The Mandalorian, this woman, Morgan Elspeth, was actually descended from the Night Sisters of Dathomir, and how she knew the location of a secret map that could lead the way to Grand Admiral Thrawn? You don't remember any of that? Well, that's understandable, because none of it was in Season 2, Episode 5 of The Mandalorian. Nevertheless, it is now the case. This forgettable villain will be much more important, but probably just as forgettable villain, in the Ahsoka show. Besides having a brand new personality and past and relevance, she throws up timeline questions that the show, across the first seven episodes, simply refused to answer. When precisely are we at the moment? Back when Ahsoka beat her in Shogun World, a Westworld reference, here? Yeah? We were in, I believe, 9 ABY. That's when, for this show's purposes, Ahsoka captured Morgan. Mando Season 3 jumps forward to 11 ABY for, well, reasons. Oh, and it does jump forward, by the way. I know Favreau was hazy on this point. He said two years, then he tried to row that all the way back to the boathouse. But it's clear from the world as we see it in Mando Season 3 that at least two years did, in fact, pass in-universe. Navarro has developed significantly, Botox Karen amassed and then lost an entire Starfleet. Moff Gideon has escaped capture and set himself up on Mandalore, growing his clone babies. All that stuff takes time. When first watching Ahsoka, I did it the kindness of assuming that it was still set in or around 9 ABY, either concurrently with or very shortly after the events of Mando Season 2. Because if this show takes place concurrently with or after Mando Season 3, then Morgan has been in prison on this spaceship and travelling the galaxy for two whole ass years, which just seems ridiculous. Mind you, the Mandalorian has set new standards of ridiculousness, so I suppose it's not impossible. <laughs> How embarrassing. But even making the charitable assumption, it sits awkwardly. Because in Mando Season 3, the Imperial Remnant Shadow Council has already been preparing for Thrawn's imminent return for quite some time. I've spoken of his imminent return. Perhaps it's time we look to new leadership. It's a source of frustration for Moff Gideon, who moans that despite Thrawn's return being imminent, he's not heard so much as a single rumour in all the galaxy about Thrawn himself, who is notably absent from Shadow Council meetings. We might take it from that that Thrawn's imminent return is from the exile mentioned in the opening crawl to this episode. For the uninitiated Ezra Bridger, Rebel's protagonist, communed with some sentient force-sensitive magic wolves to get to an ancient temple to access the world between the worlds to rescue Ahsoka herself from a fight with Darth Vader, and then used some hyperspace whales to warp himself and Thrawn into a far distant galaxy. This is what happened to Star Wars while your back was turned. Dave Filoni and his stupid fucking hat picked it up on the side of the road, roofied it, screwed it, then dumped it in a ditch next to a lay-by covered in furry cum. But anyway, the timeline. We know that Thrawn is going to appear in this show, but if this is still 9 ABY, then two years later, Thrawn still isn't back. Not in the galaxy proper, anyway. But if he's still in the other galaxy, then how have the Shadow Council been preparing for his imminent arrival? How does he get back to our galaxy in this show, and the trailer suggests that that's what he does, only to piss off again by the start of Bando Season 3. Does the Shadow Council know where Thrawn is? Do they even know if he's still alive? 
Have they instead been playing a confidence trick, telling all their fellow Imperials that Thrawn is definitely coming, just like Jesus, while in fact having no clue if he is, because they've never seen nor spoken to him, just like Jesus? Does this mean that the entire Imperial Remnant is just a bunch of fucking morons who didn't think to question why they were gearing all their plans around the return of a guy who might be dead from a place they can't find via means they haven't created? A good question for another time. Oh well, fair enough, Maz, you're the expert on those. But it is curious, and I wonder whether this show will actually resolve these questions, or whether it's yet more evidence of non-planning on the part of Favreau and Filoni. Thrawn returns in 9 ABY, but hasn't returned yet in 11 ABY? Or Thrawn doesn't return in 9 ABY, and he still hasn't come back by 11 ABY, but they still expect him to? Or this is 11 ABY, after all, and Morgan's just been festering in a cell block on a New Republic cruiser for two years? One other thing to note, assuming that this is all set before Mando Season 3, where noted spymaster Moff Gideon hasn't heard a single rumour of Thrawn in all the galaxy, I hear whispers from one end of the galaxy to another, and never a word of Thrawn. How precisely will this be reconciled? Does it mean that nobody involved in the events of this show ever thinks it worth mentioning to anyone that they're hunting the Empire's messiah? Ahsoka never bothered to tell Luke about it, for instance? While she has form where that's concerned, she's been hunting for Thrawn since Mando Season 2, and didn't think it worth telling Luke anything about it later in the Book of Boba Fett. And that's not even the worst example of her being tight-lipped. In Rebels, Darth Maul, because he's still alive, somehow, whatever the fuck, explicitly tells her that Darth Sidious is controlling the Senate and grooming Anakin to be his apprentice, and she didn't think it worth telling the Jedi Council in the meeting she had with them all of, what, like 10 minutes later? Yeah, all that genociding could have been avoided, but she's just a reticent kind of gal, you know? Anyway, I've kept all of this in the script because it's a good way of showing how timelines in interconnected series are, well, interconnected and important. It's important to know where in time we are, and where in time these events are compared to the known events of elsewhere in the galaxy, because their placement in time has significant connotations and consequences. It can be the difference between a character being incomprehensibly stupid and merely rather stupid. It is, in short, the difference between a plot making sense and not making sense, and Ahsoka gives us not the slightest clue where we are until its penultimate fucking episode, when we learn that we are set after Mando Season 3 after all, meaning yes, Morgan has indeed been rutting in a cell block for two years, Ahsoka herself has been on pause, and the Imperials have been incomprehensibly stupid, and Luke is still none the wiser. Back to the present, whenever that is. Morgan tells Big Ray that Ahsoka knows about the map, and she knows about Thrawn, meaning I do have to ask, if you knew about the map, Morgan dear, what were you doing pissing about in Shogun World in Mando Season 2? Why were you holed up in a fortress cosplaying as a samurai princess when you could have been off getting the map and bringing Thrawn back? What even is this map you speak of anyway? Well, don't worry, we'll get answers to that one in just a moment. It's a doozy, you'll love it. We skip quickly over the title slate and pick up again in some dusty ancient temple on a nameless world, Ahsoka strolling through the pillars and the statues. It looks a bit washed out, but oh, some of the details are impressive enough, I suppose. Somewhat less impressive in other instances, I'm pretty sure you can see exactly where the volume screen begins and ends here. Just compare the textures, and also the open space in which Ahsoka is walking, to the overly cluttered, slightly off perspective-wise backdrop outside the circle. Ahsoka walks to the centre of the stone circle and slices through the roof of an underground vault, fortuitously not landing on and crushing anything important, where we discover a chamber full of strange carvings and a fifth element reference. Judging by the sinister cutaways to the sinister carved figures, you almost expected some sort of evil power to be lurking here, some sort of ancient magic or some old booby traps, and the non-appearance of any of these things is disappointing, since had we seen Ahsoka essentially doing Indiana Jones or Cal Kestising her way past traps and obstacles, we'd learn something about her character. We'd see her ingenuity, her smarts, her abilities. Yes, yes, hello Rebels fans in the chat, I see you there. I know you've all seen this from her already, but you are not most people. Instead, it's as simple as twisting the head of a pillar to reveal the fifth element reference, which crumbles away to reveal the testicle McMuffin, the map that points the way to Thrawn, or rather the codex within which a map that points the way to Thrawn can be found. I do love me some mystery boxes. 
If this is all bringing back bad memories of The Force Awakens and the map to Luke Skywalker, the one that he left in order to help people find him on the island he went to because he didn't want to be found, well, good, because it's almost exactly the same device, with a bit of the Sith dagger from The Rise of Skywalker thrown in as well. Because, and I put this all as simply as I possibly can, why? Who made a codex that contained a map that pointed to a galaxy in which Thrawn can be found, and why? And when, for that matter? It's not as if anyone particularly planned for Ezra and his time whales to spin Thrawn into another galaxy. Who made the map, and when, and why? And why is it buried, in which we will shortly learn, are the ancient ruins of an old Night Sister temple? Given the process of discovering it requires that Ahsoka turn the tops of the pillars in the Night Sister temple, no, this does not constitute puzzle solving unless you're a plank who struggles to tie their own shoelaces, well, is it reasonable then to assume that the Codex itself is a Night Sister relic? I guess that might sort of partially explain how newly Night Sister derived Morgan might have become aware of it, but then wouldn't she have had to know that Thrawn had been spun across to one specific distant galaxy in order to know that the Codex contained instructions for how to get there? And if that's the case, how could she have known that? Oh, oh, it was just kind of magic, I guess. Witches and stuff. Oh. How long has the thing been down here? What ties it to Thrawn? How could it have been made before Thrawn was sent away and yet point to Thrawn? Why couldn't it be pointing to any far distant galaxy? What's the connection between them? And why has it taken this long for anyone to find it? Even Morgan knew about it before she was captured by Ahsoka in Mando Season 2. How did Ahsoka get the information out of Morgan, given how important Morgan knows it to be? Does any of this make sense? But Platoon, that's only episode one. Yes, and none of this is answered by the close of episode two, or three, or four, when we do finally get some answers around episodes five and six, well... Oh, my goodness, yeah. The fuckery is dark and full of shite. Ahsoka tries to radio her droid pilot friend to pick her up, but he's too far out of range and then she's accosted by some assassin droid things that are, put politely, staggeringly shit. Even they are assassins, why didn't one of them sit a long way away and snipe her with a gun? Why do they all use crap melee weapons and announce their presence? Not very assassin-y. HK-47 is not impressed. Answer. Select grenades, sonic screamers, cluster rockets, and plasma charges. Mines are also effective, since many Jedi will run to meet you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Silly Jedi. Outmatched by Ahsoka, because of course they are, the surviving droids decide to initiate self-destruct protocols. For some reason, this takes a ludicrously long time, during which Ahsoka is able to run clear out of the temple district and board her ship before the explosion can catch up with her. So the first order question is, why does it take them this long to blow up? Could it be that we just needed the footage for the trailer? The more pertinent follow-up question, though, is, well, these assassin droids have come here because they desperately need the map to find the way to Thrawn. They've accosted Ahsoka because they want the map from her. Had she tripped and fallen over, if their self-destruct had had its desired effect, they would have vaporized her, but they'd also have vaporized the map and, indeed, the entire temple which we'll later learn is vital to unlocking the Codex to get the map to begin with. In other words, had the droids succeeded here, Thrawn would have been stuck in that distant galaxy forever. And these droids are here because they need the map to get Thrawn back. Somehow I don't think their little mechanical noggins thought this one through. Fortunately for the villains, the hero escapes. Ahsoka has a chat with Huge Wang. Apparently he was in the animated shows, whatever, I don't care. The pertinent bit of his backstory, besides that he has a long history with the other characters in this show that most of the audience does not, is that he is an old Jedi professor droid who knows old Jedi stuff that will occasionally be useful later. Ahsoka upbraids him with mild but friendly exasperation because they're old friends, which you now know because I've just told you that it's so. She upbraids him for taking the ship so far away that they lost contact with each other. If you didn't keep at such a safe distance, maybe we wouldn't have lost communication. Huge Wang implies that he's just following old Jedi mission protocol. Just following standard Jedi mission protocol. Apparently old Jedi mission protocol entails moving your ship out of effective communications range. If that's the case, I'm honestly surprised Order 66 killed so many Jedi, because they should really have all found stupid ways to kill themselves, 
Long before Creamy Sheev had his way with them, Ahsoka tells him that the Order doesn't exist anymore. Somebody really should have paged the New Republic captain from earlier. Huge wang. It asks one of those questions I raised earlier. How did Ahsoka get Morgan to tell her about the map? To which Ahsoka responds. Let's just say I didn't follow standard Jedi protocol. <clears throat> did, um, did you torture her? Asked Clown. Did you mind probe her? Are you maybe a little bit evil? That's all we're going to get by way of explanation, by the way, and I'm honestly not sure what the audience is supposed to take from it. Ahsoka got the information by not following Jedi ways, which rather implies she did something dark and nasty. I'd not be opposed at all to an exploration of her character that grapples with the evil deeds desperation so often produces, but I really don't think we're going to get very much of that. This show's preferred approach to character building, where Ahsoka is concerned, is just to have her take a long time to say nothing in between lots of ambiguous stares. Characteristics the show's defenders will call stoic, and most normal people will call boring. It's a problem that becomes much more apparent later, but stoicism is not of itself particularly interesting on a character level, not least because it's designed to forego the sort of emotions and feelings and irrationality that comprise important parts of human behavior. A compelling stoic character should ideally be stoic for a reason the audience understanding what they are holding back. And once again, if you've seen Rebels and the Clone Wars, then you probably do look at Ahsoka's character in much this way. Ahsoka's long silences are more interesting if you know what it is she is not saying, but as I'm going to have to keep pointing out because the show keeps doing it, most people did not watch the animated shows, and presenting your protagonist as boring and blank probably isn't a very good way to encourage them to watch the animated shows either. Their ship is then hailed by Home One, to inform them of the incident aboard the New Republic ship from earlier. I think it's the last time we'll really have to treat with it, but it does deserve to be emphasized that all these little references to it make its captain seem even more staggeringly dumb. It's this easy to radio your allies about happenings elsewhere in the galaxy. Ahsoka has been told about the raid on the ship because the captain of the ship that was raided was too stupid to mention to anyone else about his strange definitely not Jedi visitors. What a fucking plonker. So Ahsoka and HUGE WANG type is based to rendezvous with Home One, and this all looks lovely, actually. For some reason, it gives me flashbacks to playing X-Wing Alliance, transferring from the Defiance to the Liberty. You wouldn't think a mission called Flight Staff Transfer would be particularly interesting, but that old game is actually really good story-wise. You're the rookie kid of the Azamin family, forced to turn to the Rebels for safety after your treacherous uncle sells out to the Empire, kills your dad, and steals the family business. And there's lovely environmental and log-style storytelling. It just makes you feel like you really are this young pilot kid thrust by circumstance into a war that's so much bigger than you. It'd actually make for a pretty good show, I think. And I mention it here because I do really love that game, and it is much better than this show. It's nice seeing Home 1 again, though. I'll give the show that. And it actually does serve some kind of points, I suppose. It's not just there for memberberry purposes. This is our first introduction, or reintroduction if you've seen Rebels, to Hera. Hera is this green lady. She spends most of her time standing around as a hologram across these first two episodes, and there's really not very much to be said for her. She's a general in the New Republic, which is her job description. To see her depicted with an actual character, I don't know, watch Rebels, I guess, because. She doesn't have one in this show. Hera tells Ahsoka that Morgan has disappeared. One of the Star Wars galaxy's four known CCTV cameras happened to be placed on the stupid captain's ship, so they take a look at the hollow recording of the two not Jedi and ponder who they might be. Huge Wang suggests one of the two might once have been a Jedi, but we'll come back to that later because something remarkable is happening. Ahsoka is sharing useful information with people. The day is in a total loss. Star map? Not just any star map. This one holds the secret Morgan's after. Which is? The location of the last missing Imperial Grand Admiral. Thrawn. From this scene, we glean that Hera knew that Ahsoka was on a mission to get the Codex testicle, but Ahsoka hadn't actually told her about what it is, or why it mattered, or what it pointed to. Classic Ahsoka. So Hera is initially confused as to its relevance, 
only for Ahsoka to fill in the gaps. Uh, you'll want to remember this, by the way, because in a few episodes' time, the show is going to go on to pretend like Kira was actually on a personal quest to find Ezra, and everybody knew about it because it's her one defining attribute. I guess she just kind of forgot that in this scene, though, and never chatted to Ahsoka about it in the intermediate time between the shows. Of course, the gap she's really filling in exists for the audience, because in-universe there is absolutely no reason at all that she shouldn't already have shared this vital information. The show evidently doesn't think the opening crawl, or Morgan's subsequent link between the map and Thrawn, was quite clear enough for the target audience, which is a safe assumption since Disney Star Wars target audience has more fingers than it has brain cells, but it's also the first, and it must be said, the mildest instance of a problem that's going to dog the show going forward. Non-diegetic exposition dumps. Characters explaining things to each other that they have no business not knowing already. This problem is going to occur a lot, but it's not impossible to fix. What Ahsoka is really missing is a novice character, someone new both to the audience and to this world and to the history on which the show is relying. If, instead of or alongside Hera, Ahsoka had picked up a traveller, some young and impressionable Star Wars debutante, or maybe this force-sensitive young son of another character who needs training because his Jedi dad is dead, Perhaps some tomb robber who Ahsoka rescued in the course of finding the map, that character would be invaluable as a stand-in for the general audience. Things could be explained to them for their benefit and ours. Their questions would give Ahsoka a chance to explain her past, the pivotal events of Rebels and the Clone Wars, to someone who, like most of the audience, is almost entirely unfamiliar with them. Rebels itself did this with both Ezra Bridger and Sabine Wren. Having Ahsoka saddled with some young adventurer, maybe the force-sensitive young son of another character who needs training because his Jedi dad is dead, would have been a good way to broach her failures as a master to Sabine later. That character would essentially serve as a foil, someone Ahsoka could bounce off of, lecture, support, train, and explain to, thereby fleshing her out in a way that wouldn't offend Rebels fans for its repetition, while also giving the general audience something more than stoic blankness to look at. Hey, maybe it should have been the force-sensitive young son of another character who's- But that's not what we got, so never mind. Hera expresses disbelief. She says it's impossible because Thrawn died. But Ahsoka begs to differ. She says, and I quote, I started hearing whispers of his return, which led me to Morgan. Gideon, mate, do you have a minute? Can I just bring you in here, just for a second? Secrets are my stock in trade. I hear whispers from one end of the galaxy to another, and never a word of Thrawn. So you're telling me that Ahsoka, random ex-Jedi woman, had heard whispers about Thrawn's return sufficient to lead her to one very specific ex-ally of Thrawn? All of this is exposited for us, don't worry, I'm not just making it up. While Gideon, actual muff in the Imperial Remnant, actual member of the Imperial Shadow Council, actual known master of spies and secrets, has heard, by his own admission, nothing? Two years later? I'm not sure I'm buying that show. I'm not sure I'm buying that at all. Sounds suspiciously convenient. Hera asks whether if Thrawn survived. Does that mean Ezra? Trailing off? Ahsoka says, I hope so. This is going to happen a lot as well, because the show isn't really Ahsoka so much as it is Rebel Season 5. Ezra Bridger is this guy. This guy is the protagonist of Rebels, the guy who, as mentioned, used his time warp whales to jump himself and Thrawn into a distant galaxy. Because Ezra was the protagonist of that show, he not only has a long history with all our lead cast in this one, he has a deeply personal connection to them. He's pivotal in their imaginations, and the show will make him pivotal to their motives as well, slightly as here with Hera, and significantly as later with this Gen Z SJW self-insert character called Sabine Wren. The show, across the first two episodes, does do a reasonable job of ensuring that we, the general audience, knows that Ezra is significant. What it does a pretty terrible job of is making us feel that he is significant in anything but an academic sense. We'll get lots of angsty references and callbacks to establish his relationship with various people, but because so many of these angsty callbacks and references are, like this one, vague trailing off affairs, there's only so much a general audience can make of it all. But, um, yeah, more on Ezra later. In the meantime, Hera suggests they all take a look at the map, which is when we learn that it is locked inside of a codex thing. Huge wang! He says the trick to unlocking it has eluded him, so it had better be pretty advanced, right? Something that Ahsoka can't use the force to unlock? I'm assuming she tried it and it didn't work. Or she didn't, because the show kind of forgot that it can do that now. And also something that this droid, with his vast databanks, cannot fathom, and something they don't think it's worth asking anyone aboard Home 1 to take a look at. 
Because if they'd done any of those things, then we'd not have our excuse to go looking for Sabine, the only person in the entire galaxy smart enough to figure it out. All of this could be true, by the way, if only it were, well, true. Unfortunately, as we will see in short order, the trick to unlocking the Codex isn't that complicated after all. In fact, it's quite rudimentary, making it implausible that the droid couldn't do it. In fact, any amateur sleuth, cartographer, or puzzle solver could have done it in fairly short order. There were almost certainly people and droids aboard Home 1 with the necessary code-cracking abilities. By all means, manufacture yourself a pretext to go and pick up Sabine if that's what you want to do, show, but you might at least finesse it a little bit, have it that she and only she could have solved it. We are briefly interrupted at this juncture by an understated cameo by... Oh, well, actually, now looking at it, I'm not so sure. I was going to say that that is Admiral Akbar, since this is Home 1. He is Mon Calamari, and he sounds a bit like Admiral Akbar. The Defense Council is requesting an update on the incident. But, um... I'm gonna have to admit here to some truly shocking racism. I think all fish people look the same. I know, I, I know I'm a bigot. Fish people, lives matter. Reparations for the fish people. Fish power. I need to get over my pescatarian fragility. But I'm working on improving myself, all right? Just leave me alone. Ocean Man tells Hera that the Defense Council is awaiting an update on the incident, an update that presumably rests on the injunction, do not put fucking morons in charge of your starships again, but which presumably does not include any mention of Thrawn or the map or the Imperials' search for him, since if it did, then Gideon would have been aware of it two years later. Ahsoka and Hera both know of a mysterious someone who would be able to crack the Codex, but Ahsoka ominously says, I'm not sure she'll want to help. She is Sabine Wren, of course, and yes, she absolutely will want to help, since the map is the key to finding Ezra. Why would she not want to help? Could it be the show has invented a bunch of off-screen cannon to pile on top of all the cartoon cannon, just to make it that much harder to understand what the fuck is going on? I think it might be that. So off we go to this planet to meet these people, all of whom will be familiar to you, no doubt, if you've seen Rebels, none of which will be if you have not. I believe the planet is meant to be called Lothal? site of the big final battle in Rebels? Rather, a lot of this section tracks with the closing moment of Rebels, from the location to the mural on the wall, but what doesn't quite track is, once again, the timeline. Here in Rebels, we see this mural. We are here picking up now in Ahsoka at the dedication ceremony for that mural. Yet rather a lot of time would seem to have passed since then. The final scene of Rebels implies that Sabine Wren went off with Ahsoka in a bid to find Ezra. Ezra's out there somewhere. And it's time to bring him home. We are shortly to learn that in the intervening time, Ahsoka may have tried to train Sabine as a Jedi, though I think I'm right in saying that A, Ahsoka isn't even a Jedi herself, and B, Sabine was never depicted as being particularly, if at all, Force-sensitive. In off-screen time encompassing indeterminate length, something went wrong between them, and so Sabine returned to Lothal, where we pick up her story in this show. So, questions. In the first place, how long has it been? This guy cock teases us with his introduction to the ceremony. We learn that it has been a whopping several years since the close of Rebels and the defeat of the Empire. Not seven years, several years. On this day, several years ago, the Empire was defeated. Not really all that helpful, my dude. In the second place, what went wrong between Ahsoka and Sabine, and when? Why did their fetch quest for Ezra morph into seemingly a mission to train Sabine as a Jedi Padawan, and what then went wrong? In the third place, what specifically went so wrong that the mission to find Ezra was abandoned? Because that's the stated objective as given by Sabine at the close of Rebels, and that's going to be portrayed as her principal motive in this show, yet here she is, an uncertain number of years later, loitering around in her big old tower doing fuck all. Yet we know Ahsoka continued looking for Thrawn in the intervening time, that's what she was up to when we first bumped into her in Mando Season 2. And we know that the search for Thrawn and the search for Ezra are inexplicably bound up together. So why would Ahsoka's failure to train Sabine to be the Padawan she was never really meant to be anyway have seen Sabine abandon the search for Ezra while Ahsoka continued it alone? Some of this might get answered in subsequent episodes, and all of it should be answered in subsequent episodes, meaning little of it probably will be answered in subsequent episodes, Little of it satisfactorily, anyway. For now, we're simply reintroduced to Sabine, in just about the most unappetizing way imaginable, except for you connoisseurs of our shots out there. Gay. 
gay. Yeah, dude, that looks totally gay. Oh. Here we are at the dedication ceremony for a distinctly dodgy looking mural. Recall, or if you've never seen Rebels, just take it from me, that this mural was commissioned for and dedicated to the little band of heroes who saved the whole planet from the Empire. And, um, this is their reward. It's not unlike turning to someone who rescued you from genocide and rewarding them with a deviant art collage. Not the most fitting celebration I can think of. Fidelity to the animated show produces something that looks, well, a bit too cartoony in this one. Why is there a giant furry there, you might be asking? The answer is I believe that Rebels has magic wolves in it. <laughs> that you really want to go watch Rebels now, right? Sabine is due to give a few words honoring Ezra at the ceremony, but when she's called upon, we find that she has gone AWOL. Sabine is a rebellious, brilliant, strong, independent, stunning, and brave young woman, you see. And to emphasize the point, she's absconded from this dedication ceremony and gone riding her hoverbike along a pointless highway while rock music plays in the background. Totally gay. Liberace gay. Grumpy old bearded cameo man has commanded a full perimeter sweep in search of this oh-so-stunningly cool and rebellious small girl, which seems rather redundant. There appears to be precisely one highway out of the city, though why hoverbikes should be restricted to highways is anybody's guess, and they all know where she lives. She lives in what looks to be the only other building on the entire fucking planet. You might have spotted it. It kind of stands out. I don't think it's a mystery where she might have gone. But no, no, we must do a full perimeter sweep, just to be sure. Two pilots spot her and begin a protracted and pointless negotiation while on the move. At that speed, she should be choking on bugs and air. To nobody's surprise whatsoever, they failed to stop her, but then they didn't really need to bother. They really could have just flown ahead and picked her up from her giant tower house. But never mind. The point has been proven. Sabine Wren is super special cool source punk rock rebel genius awesome girl. You know that because she doesn't take orders and she listens to cringe rock. All right, look, Commander, I have my orders. I'm gonna need you to pull over. Well, here's a new order. Get lost. She pops back home and she opens a hollow log from Ezra and here is an opportunity for me to moan about that not especially diegetic expo dumping that this show so often goes in for. It's a bit of a bugbear, but I think it's a fair one. When in any medium, whether books, TV, film or video games, you decide to have audio or video logs to serve as colour content or exposition vehicles, the question you have to ask yourself as their creator is not just what do I need the audience to know, but why would this character need to be listening to this at this precise moment? Why would this this character have decided to leave it in that precise moment. Why are they saying the things they are saying, and why are we hearing it now? It's a cousin of the exposition through dialogue fault that this show also displays liberally. The presence of conversations between characters who have no actual need to be having these conversations, because the premise has it that they already know everything they're telling each other. In this particular case, we ask, why is Sabine looking at this holologue now? What's the point? Why has she chosen this particular moment to wistfully replay something that's been in her possession for several years, which she's had ample opportunity to replay to her heart's content? We know what Filoni is up to. This hollow log is a neat and tidy way of reintroducing the audience to Ezra himself and to his relationship with Sabine in particular. But we don't really know what Sabine is up to. She's just turned down the opportunity to speak about Ezra at a ceremony held in his honor, which amounts to passing up an opportunity to make others share in the feelings she holds for him. And she's passed up this opportunity to instead go back and replay a log that tells us something new, but her nothing new. It's not the most egregious example of clunky premises for exposition in this episode. You can charitably read into it that Sabine is wistful and this anniversary is focusing her wistfulness, but it is a bit jarring. What's rather more jarring is the content of the log itself, because that is textbook clunky exposition. It's not a particularly natural message for one close friend or lover to leave to another close friend or lover. For one thing, it's too narrative heavy, it's far too impersonal. Hey, Sabine. I'm sorry for disappearing on you. I made this recording because, more than the others, I need you to understand. As a Jedi, sometimes you have to make the decision no one else can. So that's what I did to defeat Thrawn. We've been through a lot, grew up together in this rebellion. And we're not really family, but you're like a sister to me. I know your fight isn't over, and now I won't be there to help you. 
And I'm counting on you to see this through. May the force be with you. Ezra essentially stands there and says, Hello, Sabine Wren. I am your good friend, Ezra Bridger. I went away and disappeared a few years ago so that I could be the bad person called Thrawn. Here is our relationship in academic terms. You were always like a sister to me, rip shippers. Goodbye, Sabine Wren. From your pal, Ezra Bridger. It's just not the sort of message you leave to someone who actually is all the things he's just described. It's narrative exposition, it's aimed at the audience, not aimed at Sabine. It lacks much by way of the personal, feelings, the unspoken stuff. It's just too formal, too formulaic in the way that it conveys all the information an unfamiliar viewer might need, but none that Sabine would need from him. This was never going to be an easy thing to pull off, but if you are going to do a show that rests so heavily on Rebels lore, that relies so much on long-established relationships, there are still subtler ways of conveying these things than having hollow logs relate them directly to the audience. We will, for example, shortly learn that Sabine and Ahsoka don't really get on anymore, and having them ventilate an argument that happened off-screen might be a useful leveler. Rebels fans don't know any more than the general audience about what happened between the end of Rebels and the beginning of this show, so their conflict of visions is a natural place to exposit by a remove. Air their grievances, and the audience learns then about their motives, which includes Ezra, whose importance could still be established via a log of this sort, albeit a subtler one, one that isn't meant to shoulder the burden of all the overt exposition all by itself. We cut away then to the wreckage of the temple from the beginning of the episode, Millie Eilish gazing vacantly about. It's here we learn that Morgan is a descendant of Night Sisters for some reason, though whether she herself is a Night Sister or has any of their powers is as yet unclear. Big Ray presents the dichotomy we highlighted earlier. Either the Jedi has the map, or it was vaporized. Probably not a contingency you wanted to introduce, given how important the map is to you. Morgan decides that Ahsoka has it because fate has decided our next move, which really is just guesswork unless Morgan does, in fact, have some latent Night Sister magic in her somewhere. The Night Sisters, for those unfamiliar, are essentially, yes, witches. They live mostly on Dathomir in a wonderful witchy matriarchy and could use the dark side of the Force in interesting and magical ways. They were also known to ride rancors from time to time, because lesbianism gets old pretty quickly and what's a gal to do when she's bored of the JJ except ride large animals, or maybe sit on the washing machine while it's switched on? Morgan tells Big Ray to send Biddy Eilish to Lothal. Why, you might be asking? How? What leads her to suspect that Ahsoka might be on Lothal? Feminine intuition, or witchcraft, but then again they are the same thing. Big Ray explains that it isn't witchcraft, though. No, it's not witchcraft. It's because Ahsoka's apprentice is on Lothal. But that still requires that Morgan knows that Ahsoka has decided that Sabine is the one that she needs to unlock the Codex, which I think requires far too many leaps and assumptions to be mere guesswork. If it isn't witchcraft, it's bad writing. Don't just dismiss the witchcraft, Dave. Magic actually helps you out in this situation. You might further wonder why it is that Big Ray isn't going with Bitty Eilish, given how vitally important this mission is and how integral to their plans the map is. Given they've decided Lothal is the place to go to find the map, they must surely have concluded that Ahsoka and Sabine are together on Lothal, which odds are already a bit unfair even if you discount the fact that Lothal is enemy territory and liable to provide support to its heroes against your attackers. There's no reason I can think of for Big Ray not to accompany Billy Eilish, and yet he doesn't. I guess they're just hoping that by some contrivance of fuckery, Sabine will take the map and disappear off by herself, where she can be taken out more easily by Billy Eilish alone. A shot for shot Rebels tribute follows back on Lothal, as Ahsoka arrives flanked by two sex wings, and Sabine goes off to meet them in the city. Their reunion is awkward and tense. Grumpy beard cameo man whispers to Sabine that she'll want to hear what Ahsoka has to say, which I think constitutes redundant information. If the show wanted to play off Ahsoka and Sabine's broken relationship, Sabine being reluctant to hear what Ahsoka Ahsoka had to say, well then why did Sabine come all the way over here to meet them? Why didn't she just stay in her tower, or go somewhere far away to avoid them? We've already seen her leave a formal engagement because she didn't want to be there for reasons. The fact she's come back to hook up with Ahsoka kind of implies she wants to hear what she has to say. But this is the tension the show is grappling with. Research is pointless for all of this, by the way. I'd assumed, after the opening catastrophe of nonsense, that the show had lapsed into a long love letter to the animated shows, hence much of its content, the long, angsty glances, the half-finished reference 
references, the clunky exposition dumps compensating for the half-finished references being not much more than meaningless. But when I went to look up the history between Sabine and Ahsoka that could explain their cold reunion here, I found nothing. It all happened off-screen, at some point between the close of Rebels and the opening of Ahsoka. That is not necessarily a problem in and of itself, it can in fact provide a good opportunity. As mentioned, it puts Rebels fans and the general audience on a more level playing field, though that is a relative term, but it remains quite annoying since research pays off in decoding the majority of the references around which this show is based, yet it is futile for so important a character beat as this. This off-screen relationship is highly important since it excuses this particular scene taking almost exactly four times longer than it should because these two estranged friends slash partners engage in a protracted bout of staring. Ahsoka decides, fuck it, here's the testicle. We can find Ezra. And you wonder whether this is really the best use of her character here, since hitherto, finding Ezra hasn't actually been her guiding motive. Finding Thrawn is her principal motive. Since the show wants to portray a rift between she and Sabine, this might have been a handy way of showing it. Have Ahsoka explain the testicle and explain its use in finding Thrawn? Have Sabine draw the link between Thrawn and Ezra? And then you've established an important point of difference between them, their motives. They overlap, that eventually explains why they have to go out on the hunt together, but it gives them something to overcome, very different goals and priorities. That could be fleshed out over subsequent scenes, Sabine angry at Ahsoka's focus on Thrawn and her seeming carelessness about Ezra, accusations of heartlessness and betrayal, yet nevertheless they're forced to work together and could over time come closer together. I don't doubt the last bit's going to happen by the way, but the show has missed an opportunity to establish a clear and present split between them in the present, instead it's relying on that mysterious falling out that occurred some time after Rebels. Another Another long scene follows, as Sabine takes a look around the ship, fondly reminiscing about things most of us aren't familiar with, references once again pleasing a tiny minority of the audience and wasting everybody else's time. Get on with it! Yes! Get on with it! Get on with it! I am enjoying this scene. Get on with it! Sabine takes a look at the testicle, but she can't immediately decipher it. She and Ahsoka have a chat about where home is. Ahsoka says that her ship is her home. I go where I'm needed. Which affords Sabine a chance to be a bitch. Not always. Ooh, sick burn. I, I assume, I mean, I haven't got a clue, because the burn isn't referencing anything that anybody knows about these two, save the fact that something went wrong at some point. It's not an impermissible way to explore characters and relationships, but it is most definitely a tease. And as anyone who's ever been teased knows, how receptive you are to teasing very much depends on what you've got to invest in. Teased by a friend? Funny, reciprocal, you love them anyway. Teased by a lover? Hot and erotic, probably and leading to sex a known and important payoff. Teased by someone you don't know though in a standoffish, bitchy kind of way referencing a flaw you've not even begun to identify? Mm, kind of unpleasant, kind of annoying, not really endearing in any way. This is the scene where we learn that off screen Ahsoka decided to take on Sabine as a Padawan learner, which is awkward because again, going off my limited knowledge of the animated shows, Ahsoka wasn't a Jedi, isn't a Jedi now, and Sabine isn't force sensitive. We actually have this fact confirmed for us later by Tenant Droid. I have known many Padawans over the centuries, and I can say I safely say your aptitude for the Force would fall short of them all. We know, on a meta level, why Filoni has decided to invent this premise. It gives us a conflict that our two leads will have to overcome. But what's the in-universe explanation for a non-Jedi taking on as a Padawan someone who's never demonstrated much, if any, affinity with the Force? Sabine could wield melee weapons, she could use the Darksaber, she used the odd lightsaber even. But if that's the entry requirement for becoming a Jedi these days, I might as well sign up. I can wield melee weapons, and my midichlorian count is higher than Sabine's is. My doctor called it AIDS, but you know, midichlorians sometimes show up as AIDS. What are you doing? Checking your blood for infections. I need an analysis of this blood sample I'm sending you. Wait a minute. The reading is off the chart. I'd say we'll find out about all of this, but will we really? 
My suspicion at this stage is that we'll get the events filled in for us, the fact that Sabine was raised as a Jedi and what went wrong, but probably not the why she was trained. And that is just a hunch, but it is an educated hunch, a hunch informed by the general writing quality of Disney Star Wars, where the why of things is very seldom addressed. Before Ahsoka and Sabine have a proper fight, Tenon Droid interrupts them with an update. Sabine asks to take the testicle and the temple scan somewhere else, somewhere she can think more clearly, but Ahsoka says no, which is fair enough. This is a mightily important testicle. You don't just let someone take your testicles off you, unless you're a hormonal teenager with comorbidities and a predatory farmer-link doctor or therapist, but you shouldn't just let someone take your testicles off you. What is not fair enough is that, again, the pretext for this entire meeting is that these two characters know each other very well. They have a long history together. They know each other's flaws and tendencies. Ahsoka is here because she is very familiar with Sabine, so she has absolutely no business being surprised when having told Sabine not to take her testicles away, Sabine takes her testicle away. Of course she did. She's a headstrong, rebellious, stunningly bold and brave superwoman who does what she wants when she wants. We know that, and we met Sabine for the first time a couple of scenes ago. You, Ahsoka, met her years ago. You lived with her for fucking years, and you know her inside and out. And given this is Disney Star Wars, and given the multicolored hair and the mutual bitchiness, that might be more than a metaphorical statement. Who knows? Maybe we'll find out where those tentacles go, and what they're for. Tenon Droid's update, by the way, concerns the two not-Jedis who attacked the stupid captain's ship. He's taken a look at their lightsabers, you see, and he's compared them to his databanks and managed to identify one of them. Big Ray, from the design of his hilt, which bears the hallmarks of classical Jedi design as once taught in the temple on Coruscant. Big Ray, Tenon Droid explains, disappeared at the end of the Clone Wars like so many Jedi. Um, I disappeared, you mean died, right? Because that's what happened. The Jedi died at the end of Order 66, at the end of the Clone Wars. I dislike this disappeared formulation immensely. It allows Filoni the freedom to imagine an unlimited supply of Order 66 survivors who merely disappeared. A few? Fine, I suppose it's believable. But the more of them who merely disappeared rather than died, the less impactful Order 66 becomes as a result, and the more implausible their absence from the OT becomes. The Filoni-verse might be teeming with Jedi, but the Star Wars universe should not be. So Big Ray was once a Jedi, rightio then, and he has now fallen, one presumes since he earlier denied being a Jedi. We are no Jedi. Is he then a Sith? Or is he something else? I think the show is going to try and have it that he is something else. But you do begin to wonder how useful another category is. Grey Jedi or non-aligned ex-Jedi is serviceable? After the destruction of the Old Order, largely by its own high-minded incompetence, it's reasonable to suppose that some former Jedi renounce the old ways without turning to the dark side or joining the Sith. I believe that's Ahsoka's backstory, for example. But where you have an ex-Jedi who have sided with the Empire and who are working with the witches to get thrown back from another galaxy in order to revive that Empire, what exactly is the point in them not being dark side users generally, and Sith in particular? The Galactic Empire is pretty much an extension of the Sith, after all. You don't go off and fight for the Sith and the Empire while being a stickler for virtuous titles. I actually quite like Big Ray. He does give us hints that he's not purely evil or in hot to the dark side of the Force, but the worse his actions, the more evil his cause becomes, the less that status becomes believable, or even just useful as a distinction to make. So we shall watch his career with some mild interest to see if what results is complex or merely hypocritical. Sabine then does steal the testicle. Ahsoka then is surprised, though she has absolutely no cause to be, but decides for some reason that she's not going to go after Sabine to get the testicle back, even though she knows exactly where Sabine is going and where she lives and how important the testicle is. Sabine's retreat to the old comms tower is Filoni's opportunity to lift an entire scene from The Phantom Menace. At what point does a reference become plagiarism, just out of interest? It's so overt that you don't even get that little spot of niceness from the recognition of a well-done reference. You just look at it and you think, oh, they're doing the exact same thing in the exact same way? There's a minor difference in the setup, mind you. It's believable that Tatooine doesn't do much to keep track of ships entering and leaving the planet, because Tatooine is a poor backwater planet, a known hive of scum and villainy, and it probably lacks both the means and the incentive to police its borders properly. The same is not really true of Lothar 
well, though, by the looks of things. Maul could land on the outskirts of Mos Eisley because Mos Eisley wouldn't give a shit who landed where, and he has a super stealthy ship to boot. It's reasonable that nobody noticed him because nobody would even be thinking to look for him. Is it, by contrast, reasonable that Lothal, by the looks of things, quite rich and prosperous and orderly, wouldn't be keeping tabs on who was coming and going and who was landing where? I'm not convinced that that is reasonable, no. It's also broad daylight, for fuck's sake. Everyone can see you there, Billy Eilish, with your evil robes and your evil droids and your evil ship, parks right outside city limits and spying on people. And it's not like Lothal is a non-aligned planet either. We just got done celebrating its liberation from the Empire by the rebels. Its rulers are war veterans. You'd think they might be paying a bit more attention. The sun is setting, Sabine returns home with the testicle and sets about decoding it. Turns out it's simply a matter of comparing the symbols on its face with the scan of the temple and looking for matches. Not exactly advanced code-breaking stuff that Sabine and only Sabine was capable of. Someone in chat has offered up the explanation, she is smart. Which is, <laughs> yes. I mean, she, there you go. A, a Disney Star Wars female, she obviously. Yeah, that that is good. the answer to everything. Yeah. Was I the only person here that was expecting the chains to come out of the walls with hooks on and bed into her body as she solved the Hellraiser ball? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were hoping. Yeah, I that. thought that was right. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Was that was anyone when they were watching this along? Did you have any chance of like following along with what she's doing and figuring out how she's matching it all together? Because I was just waiting for it to finish and move on to the next thing. I was just going to assume that it was bullshit, so I stopped paying attention. I was waiting for it to finish, but we get another long brooding expo dump as she's doing all of this, because that's just how this show works. Ahsoka has a bitch to hear her about Sabine being difficult, which is an excuse for us to learn that Sabine is headstrong and brilliant and stubborn and stunning and hasn't changed a bit since whatever happened happened. Why does she have to be so difficult? Well, I bet your master found you difficult, Ahsoka. Why, yes, my master, Anakin Skywalker, who was my master back in the past, long. Yeah. Never got to finish my training because I left him at the end of the Clone Wars. As you know, best friend called Hera, with whom I am having this conversation. Just like I walked away from Sabine, even though I had good reasons for doing that, which I'm not revealing yet because mystery boxes are fun. Speaking of mystery boxes, Sabine solves the mystery testicle, which begins to project an image of the galaxy where Thrawn is stuck. Sabine takes some binoculars out to look at the noticeably cloudy sky. Not really sure what she's hoping to achieve there, but that's because the show needs her to be out on the balcony for the subsequent ambush scene to work. Sabine is ambushed, by the way. A couple of pretty naff assassin droids show up. These guys are robots, they're made of metal, and their muscles are machines. I dislike how they are treated as essentially people you could realistically best with a few punches, knees, and kicks. I think Mauler drew the comparison to Obi-Wan's fight with General Grievous, where Kenobi kicks Grievous's very hard metal shin and does himself more damage than he dishes out, and it's an apt comparison. Punching these guys should really fucking hurt. Is there no cleverer way to depict a fight between a woman and a robot machine metal thing? Couldn't Sabine use some of her Mandalorian martial prowess in a way that wouldn't believably shatter every bone in her leg? Why, when she is grabbed from behind by one of the droids, does she elbow it repeatedly in the head? What realistically would that achieve? Its head is made of metal, it's not likely to get a concussion. And why, since these are armed assassin droids, have they even entered into a melee battle at all? She was just standing out there on her balcony looking at the sky. Sniper, for fuck's sake. Use your guns, you metal morons. You do have them. You seem to think they're handy when it comes to destroying computers for no apparent reason, but why not shoot Sabine first and do all of this uninterrupted? Sabine grabs the gun off the droid holding her and shoots it twice, once through the foot and once through the chest, the implication being that it is dead, since this sort of thing tends to kill droids just as it tends to kill people. Sabine then runs off after the one that's stolen the testicle that she stole from a soldier. It's called capitalism. Oh, fuck off, Phoebe. How did you make it into this video? I mentioned that one might reasonably suppose the droid she shot is dead, because one might indeed reasonably suppose that. If it isn't dead, there's no reason it shouldn't be up and after her again. Or perhaps activating that very long self-destruct sequence we know these droids can use to wipe out all evidence of it ever having been there. There are plenty of believable things a still-functioning droid could do to cause trouble, or else to flee the scene for repairs, or else to destroy the scene and all the evidence it can. What such a droid would not believably do would be 
which you play dead, disappear from the shot, and then hide out in Sabine's apartment for the rest of the night, waiting for a protagonist to show up and find it in the next episode, there to extract the memories from his decapitated head in order to get a clue where to go next. That would be dumb as all fuckery. That would be the last thing an assassin droid would do. That would be the last thing any even occasionally self-respecting writer would have an assassin droid do. So naturally that's what happens in episode 2. Fucking droid bellend. I will note that Sabine has plenty of opportunity to double tap it, because after the fleeing droid shuts the door on her, she then backtracks, so almost certainly had to go past the droid she'd previously shut, meaning she would have noticed if it had simply disappeared, or if it was still moving, and if it was still functioning, it would have had another opportunity to take her out and generally make her life difficult, or if it was hiding in her room, she might have noticed the fact when she goes into her room to try and find something useful, but none of this stuff happens, because if it did, like it should, our heroes would be defeated, and have absolutely no means of determining where to go next. Filoni wrote himself into this dead end. There is no excuse for relying on cheats to get out of a mess you entered of your own accord. Sabine radios for help. Ahsoka is still having a gabber with Hera, even though she knows how important the testicle is and she knows where Sabine has taken it. She and Tenant Droid fly off to assist in what I am sure is another episode 1 reference. <laughs> Over there. Fly low. Sabine, meanwhile, grabs Ezra's old lightsaber and goes outside. But surely, you'll be thinking, surely she's too late. Their enemies have what they came for, and they've had loads of time to escape. There's no reason they would just be hanging around outside waiting for you to catch up to them, right? They're hanging around outside. Fuck's sake. Billie Eilish and her droid are just standing there, have been standing there for God knows how long, waiting for Sabine to catch up in order that Billie Eilish can deliver this stunningly redundant line. We've been looking for this. Oh really? You've been looking for it, have you? I'm so glad you stood around here and waited so you could tell us you've been looking for the thing you've been quite clearly fucking looking for this whole time. I mean, seriously, everyone knows that. It's the whole reason they're here to begin with. Sabine knows it too. Assassin droids don't break into your house and steal one very specific item and run away with it without you clocking that, hey, maybe they've been looking for the thing they just stole. But that is a minor irritation. A major irritation is that there is no reason Billie Eilish should have waited around here to deliver that line. They should be gone now, far away, boarding their ship and leaving. They don't do that because Filoni wants them to have a fight, but they have no reason to want to fight at this precise moment when the testicle is the most important object in the fucking galaxy, and they have it in their possession. Even if Billie Eilish were a headstrong Sith apprentice, champing at the bit for a chance to take on and take out a Jedi, she has a droid standing right next to her and droids can move pretty quickly and independently. She could have given the testicle to the droid and had the droid go back to the ship while arrogantly waiting behind to get her fight. But that's not how Billie Eilish is characterised in the show anyway, not least because she isn't really characterised much one way or the other, and she does give the testicle to the droid, but only so that she doesn't have to hold it during the fight. The droid just stands around like a lemon while she whips out her lightsaber for a battle. A battle which, I might add, is not very well choreographed at all. Both of these bins have plenty of opportunities to poke holes in each other, but they simply don't take. Maybe they don't bother exploiting these openings, because they know that lightsabers in Disney Star Wars are non-lethal weapons, and stabbing each other won't do any good. And just like that, Sabine gets stabbed, and to nobody's surprise whatsoever, she survives. I'm fine. Oh, this is not the meme you're looking for. Stop doing this, Disney. Lightsabers used to be fucking awesome. They used to be cool. And they used to be deadly. And these three things were linked to each other. Look at poor Qui-Gon here. He got stabbed and he promptly and correctly died. His force ghost must be sitting there getting increasingly pissed off with every new Disney show that comes out. Since if he'd starred in one of these as opposed to one of the prequels, he would still be alive. If Disney Wars is anything to go by, Qui-Gon is probably listening listed in the Jedi archives for being a remarkable thing. A Jedi who actually died from a lightsaber wound, one of the only known cases. He's a fucking curiosity at this point, for fuck's sake. And no, I'm not buying the she wasn't hit in a vital organ excuse, you moron. In the first place, lungs are important. In the second place, this excuse does not work for Reaver, who also survived being gutted by a lightsaber twice. In the third place, here is Qui-Gon again. Look at him, plunging his lightsaber into the Luke Roll blast doors. Look what it is doing to those doors. Now imagine that it's happening to your flesh and your organs. No. Getting stabbed where Sabine gets stabbed all the way through for as long as it's there is a mortal wound. She should be dead, but she's not because she's too stunning and brave to die. And it's such absolute fucking stupidity. 
And look at this fight here. Here, George wanted Obi-Wan to get beaten by Dooku, but not killed by him. He wanted to give Anakin a chance to jump in and save the day. So, note the wounds the Dooku inflicts. He does not run Obi-Wan through with his lightsaber, because back then that sort of thing was commonly accepted to cause a severe onset of death. Dooku wounds Obi-Wan, incapacitates him, leaves him defenseless, but in a way that allows time for death to be averted. Why not do something like that instead? Even accepting that Billy Eilish should have waited around to have this fight to begin with, which she absolutely should fucking not, why not have her inflict a severe injury on Sabine? one bad enough to make her lose consciousness, but one that doesn't leave you marvelling at the fact that she's still alive. You then have to contrive some excuse for Billie Eilish not finishing the job, of course. That's not impossible, though. Hell, it might even have been better to show Billie Eilish choosing not to kill Sabine, especially if we're going to go on to portray her as being something other than a Sith. Maybe some latent Jedi training in her kicks in, maybe hint at some underlying compassion, or a moral code that prohibits killing the defenseless. T is then a a more complex villain than we might have been expecting her to be. She wins, she incapacitates Sabine, she elects not to kill Sabine. It gives Sabine a personal revenge motive, one born of wounded pride more than wounded flesh, but the ending we did get combines the worst of all the worlds. Not only does Billie Eilish wait around for a pointless fight, even though she's already got the most important object in the galaxy and her only real motive is to leave the planet as quickly as possible, not only does she inflict a mortal wound that isn't a mortal wound, there's nothing about her or her situation that can explain why she doesn't finish the fucking job. Sabine passes out, and she's gonna wake up in hospital in episode 2 pretty well completely recovered. But why didn't Billie Eilish make sure she was dead? Maybe she hasn't watched enough Disney Star Wars. Maybe she naively thought that running someone through with a lightsaber would kill them. But given she needlessly waited around here solely to have the fight, you think she might have at least checked. That, in any case, is where episode 1 ends. It's not as unremittingly dumb as The Mandalorian, though it has several moments worthy of that joke of a series. I suspect Rebels fans would have enjoyed Episode 1 rather more than I did, though even then, because of the newly invented off-screen history and its at best hazy relationship with settled canon, it might be that Rebels fans find more to be annoyed about as well as more to like. As an introductory episode, it is quite far from ideal. Setting aside the generic stupidity, relying so heavily on the history of an old animated show a lot of, if not most of the audience hasn't seen, was always going to create some pretty big challenges, and in the event, Ahsoka Episode 1 has failed to overcome them. Long stares carrying the weight of unknown knowledge aren't beguiling, they are tedious. Heavy-handed references to vitally important characters we may not have heard of or know anything about aren't, then, full of subtext, they are just opaque. Having this story serve almost exclusively as a continuation of Rebels, as a Rebels Season 5, is more exclusionary than a show that drew on those memories in telling a brand new story. And omitting the creation of any character as new to these events as most of the audience is, is put simply a terrible, terrible mistake. Dave Filoni does quite clearly care about his characters, about that corner of the Star Wars universe he spent years crafting and creating. He quite clearly cares about those things more than he cares about basic writing technique. But what he's so far failed to do is to evangelize his faith. Ahsoka is too arcane to win many converts. Most of its substance caters to those pure and chosen few who are already converted. Episode 2 doesn't so much repair the damage or fill in the gaps in our knowledge as it compounds the damage and broadens those gaps. Getting a quarter of the way into a season without much of the audience really knowing who is who and what is what and why is why, except on a dispassionate academic level at best, is very far from ideal. Ahsoka may in places look better than other Disney Star Wars offerings, in some places it may even look much better, but a struggling franchise needs much more than the occasional superficial improvement. It needs to give the audience a reason to give a shit, a reason to want to watch, a reason to trust again that even a mediocre entry can get the basics right. And so far, Ahsoka provides no such evidence. This is not, as it stands, a sensible use of our time, Disney's money, or Filoni's characters. But hey, Maybe it'll get better. Who knows? Stranger things have happened. It's just that I've traveled too far and seen too much to ignore the shite that comes from Disney. But if it does get better, I will be overjoyed to relay the news. 